you hear me okay? Yep, you're good. First of all, thank you to Lauren and Russell for this opportunity to work with the UC Alumni Wine Club again. We are very, very appreciative and excited. And thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. We really, really appreciate it. It's been a minute since we've been able to connect with our customers. So this is really fun for us. I'm gonna do a little housekeeping. We So what we're gonna do, the first thing I wanna do is make sure if you don't have your bottle of red opened, I would open your bottle of red. That'll give it- Some time to breathe. It'll, <clears throat> it'll open up nicely for you. You might even, if you choose to do so, you might pour it into your glass. If you like it, absolutely. So yeah. for, that's the first thing. And then I'm gonna make sure that we all have proper orientation on how the cheese board's sitting as we move around. So you have two very white cheeses on your cheese board. And the, the one of them has blueberries and raspberries. That should be in your upper left-hand corner. And then the round white cheese, the camembert, should be in your upper right-hand corner. And that'll facilitate us moving around all in the same order. Little bit of other housekeeping. Uh, we are going to go through, we'll taste each wine and each cheese, and we'll have an opportunity for questions like Lauren mentioned at the end of each tasting, but then also at the end, we'll do a summary of questions and we're here for any questions that you guys have. The other thing I wanted to share, I don't know if everyone caught this when you purchased the package, but. Scott and I feel so strongly about supporting the UC community. Scott went to UC, we're huge UC fans. And so we are donating $10 off of every tasting to the UC Student Emergency Fund. And the other thing, you all have been so incredibly gracious. So we are pulling all of the tips that you guys graciously paid to us, and that will go to the UC Student Emergency Fund. And then Scott and I and Urban Stead Cheese are kicking in the balance for a total donation of $500 to the Student Emergency Fund. So that's really, really exciting for us. Yeah. Um, so hopefully, you know, that makes, I know it's not huge dollars, but it makes a little difference. Let's see. I think that's my housekeeping. So we are doing the tasting from Urban Stead. So you're seeing behind us, you're seeing the bar, and of course, cheddar for the better, and we'll talk about that later. I am Andrea Robbins, this is Scott Robbins, and he is the cheesemaker here at Urban Stead Cheese, but he's also a certified sommelier. And so he- And a bear cat. And a bear cat, good mm -hmm. point. Um, I Hopefully you can see him repping his bear cat here. And then I'm gonna do a quick, overview of who we are, why we are, what we do, and somebody sending me a message, let me make sure. Nope, it's in a story. Uh, and what Urban Stead Cheese is, and then we're gonna jump right in. I guess, would you recommend that now's a great time to get into that shut and blow? Oh, absolutely. I think there's no better time to get in and share them <laughs> Maybe we should all do a cheers. Yeah. yeah. So the white wine, we're all going to cheers. Yeah. Try to have as much fun with the tasting as possible. We're going to have a virtual happy hour. Cheers, cheers guys. Cheers. 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 And I'll tell you, the one thing I always like to start with a tasting, if there is a burning cheese or wine question, please do not hesitate to ask. There are no, it's cliche, but there are no stupid cheese questions. And it's part of the reason that Scott and I do what we do is to bring cheese to the people of Cincinnati. We started Urban Stead Cheese February of 2018. Realistically, I think it's fair to say we started it quite a long time before that, but we opened our doors February of 2018. We made our first batch of cheese here in this facility in early February 18. So we make all of the cheese that you're gonna be enjoying tonight on your cheese board. Urban Stead Cheese is an urban cheese maker, as all of you know, because you picked up the cheese boards today or you've been in the shop. 
one time or another. Maybe you've picked up through our carryout line and we'll get back to that later. But thank you for your past support and for your current support. We really, really appreciate it. Urbanstead, we started Urbanstead for the love of cheese. Absolutely. But also I think that Urbanstead for us blends a passion for cheese and for local food and for artisan, I would say the slow food movement, but also for entrepreneurship and for community. Those are really, really important things to Scott in our personal lives. And it blends seamlessly over into how we conduct our business. And Urbanstead, because usually farmstead, cheese is made in a farmstead environment often. So we're making cheese in the city. So we're Urbanstead cheese. And what this looks like for us is, I'm gonna talk pre-COVID, uh, you know, what we do now versus what we did say in February looks very different, obviously, and for you also. But typically we pick up about 24,000 pounds of milk from a local dairy farm about 50, 45 miles east of the city every week. And we bring it back and we do all of our production here in, at the shop. So we have the tasting room out front. And then as many of you know, we have our production facilities in the back as well as our aging room. 24,000 pounds of milk is about how many gallons? I know I just asked him a number that we don't normally do a conversion on. 6,000 6, is? It's about roughly 28,000 gallons. 8.6. Pounds to a gallon? Yep. Yeah, so a gallon of milk that you get at the grocery store weighs 8.6 pounds, so. So we get it from Bulls jerseys too. Uh, so yeah, a third generation dairy farmer uh, in Morristown, just out 32, local. Uh, they have all jerseys too. Uh, as a cheesemaker, one of the things when we were putting this project together, uh, we were looking for Jersey milk. Uh, Jersey. Meaning Jersey cows. It's a breed of cow. So of, of the breed of all the cow breeds, the Jerseys have the highest protein and highest butter fat of all the breeds. So as a cheesemaker, it makes incredibly unctuous cheese, wonderful proteins, wonderful fats. Our yields are very high. Uh, and cheesemakers across the country dream of having Jersey milk at their disposal to make cheese. With. When we share with other cheesemakers that we have a full Jersey herd, they are extremely jealous. Scott and I are both grandchildren of dairy farmers as well. So my uncles still continue to dairy farm. Scott's family is no longer in the dairy farming business, but both of our grandparents, large by and large, farmed, were you mostly Holsteins? Yeah. Yeah, so Holsteins are your black and white cows. Jersey cows are your beautiful brown cows with the big eyelashes and the big wrinkles. But a lot of times, interestingly enough, uh, even your Holstein herds will have a couple Jersey cows in there. And it's because they, it helps bump the, the fat and the protein up on their milk and they get paid more the higher their fat and protein. So even a whole her Holstein herd will throw a couple Jerseys in there to change that milk fat and get paid a little bit more for their milk. So that's always just an interesting thing. But we drive our milk truck to the farm every week, pick up milk, and we bring it back here, and we do all our production right here, and we also do all of our aging right here in temperature and humidity-controlled aging rooms. And we'll talk a lot more about that as we get into the cheeses. Uh, a quick update. So what are we doing right now? Well, we're still making cheese, so, and this will be the last thing, and then we'll jump right into the cheese, but you know, we, we look back to March 15th and the day that we were required to close our tasting room, we quickly pivoted to an online format and also offering a lot of products that we didn't use to offer. And that includes meat from a local farmer, milk from a local farmer, dairy uh, or pasture raised eggs, we have local honey, we have desserts, and then of course we have all of our cheese boards. So the cheese board you guys have is a cheese board that could be ordered from our online carryout menu 
as well as all of our retail cheese, wine, all of the wines that we'll enjoy today are available retail, as well as beer. Um, if you're looking for a gift, we've got some beautiful Rookwood. So we are continuing in an online format. However, you know, we have the retail portion of what we do, which is what you guys are seeing right now, but then a huge component of what we do and have been doing is our wholesale business. And that is where we supply restaurants and shops, cheese shops and groceries throughout Cincinnati, Dayton, Lexington, Louisville, Cleveland, Nashville, Indianapolis. And we've recently landed a few really good accounts in the New York market. So we distribute our cheese ourselves locally, but we also work with a distributor to distribute through a greater region. Um, if you're going out for a burger week this week, Street City Pub has a curd burger, a, a, a burger roll. We went last night, it was amazing. So you'll see our cheese on menus throughout the city. And I think we get into cheese. And you always talk about cheese. cheese it's time to it's have time. some cheese. <laughs> Um, first things is anybody before we get started, any questions, any anything that anything to help you move through this tasting? Yes, not. Excellent. So we're gonna start with the Pine Ridge, the Chenin Blanc Viognier. The, and, the one white wine. Yes. The one Californian. Yeah. <laughs> And, and we're going to pair that with our pork. So that's so, your upper left-hand corner with the raspberries and the blueberries. So the white wine and the white cheese with the raspberries and the blueberries, and it's got some honey on top of it. So let's tell you a little bit about cork. Um, cork is one of the things that when we put this project together, we really wanted to bring back to Cincinnati. Cork is a very traditional German or Eastern European farmer style cheese. Um, very, very prominent in that part of the world. Um, and Cincinnati being such a German heritage city, I don't know how Cork never found its way to this side of uh, the side of the ocean. Um, so we've blended a little bit of honey in with the Cork. Uh, we, our Cork, we make it uh, very natural. Um, we, we ferment it to a pretty low pH, around a 4.5, so it's going to have that real natural tang to it, which the honey it really nicely balanced that kind of gives you the little sweet and sour uh, component to this. Um, but this is one of the most versatile cheeses you'll ever see. Um, you, will, you can eat it as is uh, with some berries. Um, you can make a wonderful cheesecake. You can make a wonderful veggie dip, a uh, horseradish dip. Um, all strudels in Germany are made out of it. Uh, they'll make a wonderful cheese sauces in, in Germany with this or in Eastern Europe. It'd be great uh, in a quiche. Oh, absolutely. It melts really well. Anything you use you could put cheese. it on a sandwich. Yeah, really, it's versatile enough where you could substitute Philadelphia, mascarpone, um, goat cheese, any of those, and you could use cork as a substitute for those cheeses in any recipe. A lot of times I'll explain it to people when they ask me, I'll say, it's kind of like goat cheese without the barn. I love goat cheese, but it can get a little barny for people. And that's a word we use in the cheese tasting or in the cheese, a word we use in the cheese world when we're rating or judging cheeses and barny would be one that you would talk about goat cheese can be, but pork well, is it's, not. There's a difference between cow's milk and goat's milk. There's just a different flavor profile. And some people find that a little more intimidating uh, so this has that more clean cow's milk flavor that j wonderful jersey milk so you can really cork's one of those things so you can really tell um all that high fat that's in here uh, makes that wonderful creamy texture uh, and then speaking of creamy i paired it with um pine ridges shannon block viognier blend um i really like this wine perfect for this time of year um, the Pine Ridge Vineyards, wonderful family owned. Uh, the wines that I picked today uh, are all very well, uh, for the most part, organically produced, um, very, very conscious about their green footprint uh, and just making the wines the right way. 
Uh, this is 78% Shannon and 22% Viennier. Uh, the Shannon brings that wonderful crispness, that brightness, the, the acidity level uh, that follows through the wine, that lemon, that tartness. And then mixing in a little bit of 22% Viognier, you get the honeysuckle, the weight, the depth, the richness that, that, that comes out of this wine. So those two blended together create a wonderful wine. Um, it's something very interesting because the French have been making wines with these two grapes for hundreds of years and never, and it, 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 at some point they might have, but traditionally the French do not blend these two grapes together. Uh, this was the Pine Ridge family that ran across it or, or were messing around with different blends and came across this blend and they've made it ever since the early 90s. Um, so a wonderful, rich, low-dye fruit, uh, Viognier, um, very similar climate to the Rhone Valley, which Viognier is probably most known uh, grown in the world is in the Rhone Valley. Um, but I think the weight, the texture of this wine pairs wonderful uh, with our cork and the berries. So Pine Ridge is located where? Uh, the Their home winery, the offices are in Stag's Leap in Napa. Okay, and so, and then you mentioned Lodi. So are they sourcing these grapes? They do source the uh, Viognier and the, the Chenin Blanc. Uh, the ground's way too expensive up in Stag's Leap area to grow Viognier or, or to Chenin Blanc up there. Uh, because to, you couldn't charge enough for the bottle. No, you have to, to justify it. They're, but in contrast, their Stag's Leap Cabernet, I think it's around $140 a bottle. Okay. And this is not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Viognier can be a little oily sometimes? It can be. It's a really heavy, thick, viscous type of grape. Um, but blended in the right blend, it adds a nice backbone to a particular blend. Why do you think the French, I mean, is that, would that kind of be against what they do of blending this? Um, well, traditionally, Shannon Blanc is grown in the Loire Valley, which is northern France. And the best place to grow Viognier is in the Rhone Valley. Um, they generally don't blend grapes from different regions. If, Got it. And that's probably why this was never paired, blended together. That makes sense. And I, when you and I have talked about Shannon before, he's used the term wooly. Would you? Would I refer to this wooly? Um, I don't think this has quite as wooly. You can kind of get that flavor. If somebody uh, says wooly in a wine, what does that mean? Um, it is, it's just a kind of a texture, uh, kind of a, a feel, a mouth feel that's described in this one. But maybe the Viognier makes that not? Uh, the, the Viognier hides it because that weighted oily uh, viscosity kind of mutes that shit. I'm really enjoying, guys, the raspberry with the quark. Or if I'll try to say quark correctly. It's like quack, quack, quack. I sound like I'm quacking. <laughs> but it's kind of like a KV, quack. Uh, and that's how they would say it. If any of you are familiar with Marilyn Harris, who did the radio show, I spent a long radio show with Marilyn trying to figure out how to properly say quack. And I still don't have it right. But um, I'm really enjoying it with the raspberries and the quark and the honey. Anything else you want to? About quark? Yeah. Are you going to give me some questions? Yeah, so I guess the quark. What questions do you guys have? Or And I guess the other thing I want to share is there's a lot of things on your board. We're going to focus on the cheese and the wine. You there, help yourself to yeah. nibble on everything else for the most part. Enjoy, sit back. You have some prosciutto there that's up between the quark and the camembert. And then down lower, you have a very dark salami. That is lupo. That is a... Artisan salami made from by North Country Charcuterie in Columbus. And that is, you're going to see how beautiful and dark it is. It's made with a Russian Imperial Stout. 
And then you've got some mustard on there, of course. You've got some of our pickled green beans, some olives, some those little red guys. The where's my camera? There it is. These guys are sweetie drops. They are little Peruvian pickled peppers. You've of course got some dried apricot, some mustard, some cornichon. So there's a lot of stuff there. We just wanted to give you guys a good sampling of what we have and maybe a light dinner. And we are, if anybody has questions on that first round or you wanna talk about Shannon or Beignet or Quark, please do not hesitate to ask. Hey, Andrea, it's Darla Marion. Um, hey, I, I, you've done a great job and I'm envious of everybody here because I'm actually in South Carolina, so I had to buy my own. And I, I tell you, I couldn't find some of the stuff. So I kind of make chef mine, but I'm envious of all of you guys enjoying what a great atmosphere you have and, and really appreciate everything you've done so far. Thank you and, and good information. Well, Darla, I appreciate you joining us from South Carolina. Thank you. Go Bearcats. That's oh, right. Yeah. Were you, Darla, were you able to find Quark? No, they looked at me like I was from Mars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was, a, it was a decent one and they said, hey, we can order it. I'm like, nah, I'm good. I'll just figure out what I want, but I, I'm going to definitely try and find some more of it. Even. Yeah, so it's interesting. Quark in the US, you'll see different, I'm sorry. So you'll find different versions of Quark. So the one you'll most prominently find is uh, Vermont Creameries. Uh, they are a little larger scale operation than we are. They actually use a centrifuge to separate the pro the fats of the. And when you're making cheese, you you've probably heard the term curds and wet, uh, and I may go into a little bit of this more at some point, uh, but the curds themselves become the cheese. The whey is almost a byproduct. And they'll actually run it through a centrifuge to separate the solids, the curds, from the whey, uh, which ends up being a more a thinner style, almost like a thicker yogurt versus our traditional cork. Um, we put our cork in bags, uh, like very heavy linen bags, and allow it to drain overnight, which is very traditional, um, which gives it a, a more um, a, a more solid texture to the cork versus uh, a centrifuge application. And that's really intentional for us because so many of our customers for Quark are in the chef community. And so, as you all know, you can always thin something you can't add thickness to it. So our chefs will use this in different ways. Some of them will crumb it off and use it as a topping for a salad. Whereas other ones will add liquid and that liquid, you know, if I were making say, so we sell this in just plain quark without any honey on it in the shop and people will buy it maybe to bake, but they'll also buy it I love a veggie dip, especially right now. We all have so many herbs and vegetables that I'll just add a little bit of whatever herbs I have, whether it be basil or rosemary or uh, what did I add to the last one? I can't remember. Dill. Dill. Time. That's what I was trying to think of was dill. And then I'll do maybe, I, if I didn't have anything around, I might do water to thin it. But of course, that won't give it any texture water or uh, milk rather or if i really want to tang it up i'll add a little bit of buttermilk and that's what you'll see our chefs do so we intentionally made it thicker like this and the other reason that i think ours is thicker than maybe what some people are used to when they go to europe and see it is that not all quark is has a coagulant and so coagulant when we talk about a coagulant in the cheese making world it could sometimes be an animal rennet or it could be a non-animal rennet and some cork is not they don't use that they don't set it up yeah and some of them do not even use cultures you could leave it sit on the counter and naturally culture i mean 
we culture it with lactobacillus, which occurs naturally in, in the environment. Uh, the, the same thing if you left, a, I mean, you guys left a gallon of milk in the fridge for three weeks, it's going to thicken, it's going to chunk up. That's basically lactobacillus in the environment souring the milk. We, as cheesemakers, do this intentionally uh, and, and speed up the process. We add lactobacillus into our milk to, to lower the pH as part of the magic of cheesemaking. So usually, like, it, we all know seven is a neutral. Our milk usually comes in around six, eight. Six, eight to six, eight, five is typically the pH when we bring it in. So just a touch acidic. I mean, almost neutral. And then, like Scott said, by the time that we get to the point where we have this quark here, I think this batch was about a four, five, four, six. It was, it was four, four, five. Or four, four, five. Yeah. So pretty, pretty acidic. And to put that in perspective, like what's your final pH on other cheeses? It'll be the most acidic cheese on the board. It may not come across that way, um, but as, uh, by measuring pH, it was it's the most uh, acidic. Yeah. And the honey balance is out of it out a bit. So, um, okay. yeah, that's quark. Any other questions, guys? We had some questions come through in the chat. Um, Is there a thing, guys? Lauren, I'm gonna interrupt real quick. Should yeah, I speak those? Um, if you hover over your main oh screen. God. There we go. Found it. Go. Yep. Okay. Thanks for the first, yeah. I'm glad you liked the first pairing. How long will this cheese keep in the fridge? So I'd say it'll be the quark. You know, you might get a little oxidization out on it. I would not cut all of your camembert, the little round cheese, um, to Bob's point, going around the board. So we've got the quark that we just tasted. The round white cheese is our Misty River camembert. It's a camembert style cheese. We'll talk very specifically about the cheeses. The next one around will be our aged Gouda. And then the final one, the fourth cheese is our street ched, which is our aged cloth bound cheddar. Um, Scott and Andrea, and the um, she, sorry, yeah, sorry, jump in if you were still still kind of going on that thread. No, no go uh, ahead. Do you all have another cheese cheese that you make uh that you maybe considered pairing pairing with this first wine too like what else might might go well with this first wine absolutely great question russell uh i think the tome we talked about yeah the tome to evanston which is not on this board guys so we make these four cheeses in addition to tome to evanston which is a hard cheese it's an alpine style cheese and then we also make cheese curds, of course, which we'll make fresh cheese curds next week. And then we also have a couple spreads. So pimento, our Ohio Valley pimento and a sun-dried tomato basil. But to Russell's point, I think. Yeah, the, probably the Tome to Evanston. Um, if you have a chance to, to stop in or try it, uh, it's an Alpine style reminiscent of the cheeses in the, the French or Swiss Alps. Um, very similar to like a Comte or a Gruyere. Um, and it's a very elegant, um, hard aged cheese, but um, it's subtle enough that I think the Shannon would go really well. Yeah. So, so going back to the question, um, how long will it keep? It'll definitely be good tomorrow, guys. You might see a little bit of, it won't be as fresh, but it'll definitely still be good. And I'll give you a quick cheese. 101 on keeping your cheese so if you were to come to the shop and order either when we reopen which hopefully is soon working on our reopening plan but if you buy say a half pound of cheese or a quarter pound of cheese it'll come in some really nice cheese paper and that cheese paper the co the key is to let your cheese breathe but still keep moisture in it and so in that world, cheese will last quite a while. We also sell cheese storage bags, and you'll see those at a lot of different cheese shops. 
And so cheese storage bags are a great way to do that too. If you ever have cheese in your fridge and it looks just a little lifeless, maybe the outside is just a little dry, I we call facing it, and I'm going to do it with this piece that I and have. And she's referring to the the harder aged cheese. The harder aged cheese, yeah. You wouldn't do this with a soft cheese. That's a great point. But see this piece of cheese I have here? Imagine it's like a half pound, and I have a knife here. I'm going to take and actually take the face of my knife and face across it. And you, you're and just I'm scraping off. And exposing fresh cheese. Yeah. And so I get this little bit of cheese on here. I'm taking off a little bit, but then I'm exposing fresh cheese. So if you ever had a quarter pound or a half pound or a pound of cheese in your fridge and just felt like it needed refreshed, facing your cheese is a great way to refresh it. Uh, and it, my final PSA on that is you've got that half pound of cheese in your fridge and you forgot about it. And it's got a little bit of blue on it or a little bit of mold and you think, oh, I got to throw that out. Please do not throw that out. Take and cut that mold off. Give it a little bit of a margin and you're good to go. Cheese has mold naturally. And so it won't be bad. And then Again, that's, with that's the, your the, the, hard the, cheeses. That's a great point. If you found, unfortunately, if you found mold on the cork, it's probably time to go. Yeah. Uh, but I would refer, I, you asked about how long the, the, the cork, we date the cork for uh, four weeks shelf life, and we, we know it lasts five or six weeks. I and mean, usually it's not going to last in your fridge that long. No. Um, and the, my final PSA on that is when you're done with that half pound of cheese and you've got a rind left, Toss it in a plastic bag in your freezer. And this fall or winter, when you're making a stock or a red sauce or a soup, toss those rinds in and it's going to impart all that gorgeous flavor because the strongest concentration of flavor is at your rind. So save those rinds, especially your parm rinds. Those are gold. You'll change it. Your soup will be wonderful. It'll have flavor that you can't necessarily identify where it's coming from, but it's a depth of flavor that you wouldn't otherwise get. A lot of umami. Want to go to camembert? I do. Are you guys good? And so I see somebody's favorite. Deborah, your favorite is the tome. Uh, so thank you. Our tome to Evanston is named after the neighborhood where the shop is. So where you guys picked up today, we are right on the border of East Walnut Hills, Evanston. And We've given a nod to the neighborhood with the tome. So hopefully that is a cheese that you guys will all get to taste in the near future. And just real quick, tome is just a, almost, it's a French term. It's almost a generic term that, re, that refers to a small farmhouse wheel. And, and a lot of tomes in France are named after the region that they're in. Yeah. Okay, I, did you cut the or I, mean, I cut the, so if you guys have not cut the camembert, it came in a little white round. I cut mine into. You did it into eighths. Eighths, and I left half of it intact so that it stays. And then I've got these little pieces here, and we're definitely going to eat the rind. You don't have to eat the rind, but I think the cheesemaker over here would challenge that you're missing some of the intended flavor. The French believe the rind's the best part of the camembert. Yeah. And I'd leave it. At, <laughs> so you go ahead and cut that into six or eight, and then we'll start talking about. Or if you, I mean, if you want to take a bite out of that camembert, we won't cheese shame. <laughs> <laughs> you just want to pick it up and eat it like an apple. And we're going to pair that with the uh, the rosé, guys, the Chateau Campuget. So a little bit about camembert. Camembert is a, it's considered a bloomy rind cheese, along with brie or any other white moldy cheese that's there in their own category called bloomy rinds. Um, so Brie and Camembert are cities that are actually relatively close to each other in, in France, um, both known for this style of cheese. Camemberts are generally made in a small disc form, almost like a, a, a big hockey puck, usually eight to 10 ounces. We make ours, 
in a three ounce version. Um, so you get the whole wheel. It's designed to get a whole wheel for a cheese board. Um, Real quick, can I give them a little bit of guidance? So guys, one of the things I'm gonna suggest you cut two pieces of camembert for each person that's tasting and that or at least cut it in two pieces that you taste it first without any accompaniments because it's so subtle. And then my favorite pairing is to take a slice of the strawberry and a piece of the camembert and a little bit of fig jam and an almond. So taste it by itself with the rose, taste it by itself, maybe taste it by itself with the rose and then taste it with that whole little bundle and it's the perfect balance of sweet and salty and acid and so I'm gonna let you go back to that. But as he talks about this and you're tasting through the camembert, those are the ways I like to taste it. So you were saying that we make our camembert in a little bit smaller format than traditional. So yeah, so these are three ounce versions of it. So it's a smaller version of camembert. So everybody gets of the rhyme. Um, these are the, the blue rinds, um, penicillin candidum, the white mold, uh, is very, it's no your butter. favorite, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it is, is very, is, is the secret to making a blue rind cheese. Um, so we're talking about camembert being in disc form. Brie generally is in a pie form if they cut into pie wedges. Uh, so, Brie is usually like bigger. Yeah, usually it's like a pie. And then it's cut into wedges about the same thickness. Okay. It's generally about the same thickness. Um, so as a, so a camembert is a unique cheese um, as it ages. And this is a 24 day age, I think, um, this particular camembert. Uh, our camemberts have a really small sweet spot. Um, ours, we are anywhere from about 22 to about 30, 32 days. That's the, the, the time period that we want to enjoy these. Um, I don't think we ever talked about the aging of the cork. Cork is is made fresh. Um, that is, we made that cork last week. We make cork every other week. It's designed to be eaten fresh. Um, so we pick the milk up on Sunday. You start making it on Monday. And it's ready to go on Wednesday, and it's immediately ready to eat. Um, the camembert, as far as age cheese, is a very quick camembert, a quick age. And then also being a little smaller version helps that as well. Um, but as you see, as you open it up, um, the camembert should be hopefully nice and gooey. Hopefully in the yours looks like that, that's pudgy. They all I, came I, out of the same batch. I'm yeah. guessing they all do. Uh, Smell it too. I really encourage you to smell your camembert. It's a little mushroomy. What do you pick up? A little mushroomy, a little bit. Lots of earthiness. It's just yeah. Um, and one thing that I she talked about the rind. One thing that you do like about our rind. This was in your all you guys. This was in the aging room this morning. So a lot of camembert or brie that you'd buy commercially at a grocery store, especially if you're getting a European version, they actually will send it out a week or two, maybe even three weeks before it's even ready to try to time it so when it hits the consumer that it's at its peak ripeness. And that doesn't always work very well. And by doing that, they have to wrap the cheese. By wrapping it and keeping the, the wrapping on that cheese when it's not completely mature, sometimes the the rind itself kind of gets a leatherier, uh, kind of firmer feel. Um, a real fresh camembert like you're enjoying, hopefully, um, should have a really soft, tender, enjoyable rind. Yeah, that's a good point. A lot of camembert, too, is, you know, in the U.S., our ability to enjoy and make raw milk cheeses is different than that in, the, in Europe. So in the US, if we were to make a raw milk cheese, it has to be aged 60 days and that's required by the FDA. And you know, camembert, our camembert, and most camembert in general in the US don't ever get to 60 days. And so that precludes us from being able to make a raw milk camembert 
of course the quark is not raw because it is fresh and then we choose and we'll talk about why we choose not to make raw what the good and the cheddar and we'll talk about those later but we get a lot of people who say, oh, I like that French brie or that French camembert. It's that funky, funky. And we, you know, we just can't do that in the U.S. We're not allowed to do raw milk camembert. So pretty much in the U.S., unequivocally, you'll see pasteurized milk camembert. Almost every camembert. Yeah. And it's also really difficult for us to get in the U.S. raw, raw milk camembert. I think I said unequivocally, it'll be all raw milk camembert. I meant pasteurized camembert. It's really difficult for us to get raw milk camembert because again, that camembert has not been aged 60 days. So the US- If you had a, a camembert that was aged 60 days, it would be past its prime and it really wouldn't be, wouldn't be desirable. Yeah. You, in order to actually produce that, you'd have to almost make it five, six days after making it, putting it in the refrigeration, really, really slow down the cultures and the, the bacteria activity, um, which would, would be kind of detrimental to the cheese in, in the long term. But the wine, we got to talk yeah, about Yeah, the wine. We talk about yeah, okay, so, so I paired this with, I, I wanted to be, I wanted to show that wines could be great values and really good at the same time. And I also wanted to kind of do a tour around the world. So we went from California first. Uh, now we're going to go to a traditional spot for rosés, Southern France. Um, this is Chateau Camp Puget. Um, they're located in Costa Denise, uh, which is very Southern Rhone Valley. It's an amazing area for growing grapes, as long as the grapes can handle the heat. Um, it's not great for Pinot Noir or maybe Chenin or some other grapes, but Southern Rhone's nice and hot and has this remarkable soil. Um, the Rhone Valley over thousands of years has flooded many, many times. And what it's done is allowed all the vineyards around in that area to just have small, very smooth rocks. I mean, if you walk through a vineyard, it's nothing but rocks, which is really unique. Um, the best grapes grow when they're stressed out. Uh, when they need to focus all their energy into very reproduction, very essential life. That when, when grapes are in a warm, wet, you know, very fertile soil area, they grow lots of leaves. They continue to get bigger and bigger, which is fine for the vine itself, but it's not really concentrating all that flavor and all that development of the cluster of grapes. So the Rome Valley is a perfect spot where it's not great to grow in a lot of other places, um, but for, for the two grapes that are traditionally made in this rosé, which is made, rosé is made uh, with, with uh, Grenache and Syrah, which are the two main red grapes in uh, the Southern Rome Valley, which both love the warm climate. Um, if you can, looking at the glass yourself, it's almost, almost very, very light pink in color. Um, that comes from just a very um, light maceration. Um, Rosés get their color their, from the actual skins in, in the maceration. Just the same way with red wines, get all their red color from the, the color of the skins in the maceration. If you only allow skin contact, and this is probably only four to six hours of skin. That how little skin talk that you just get that little bit of color in the actual grape juice itself. Um, but this is a very traditional um, Southern France rosé. Uh, it's got that strawberry, the raspberry, a wonderful acidity, refreshing. And I think the subtlety of this wine plays really well with the creaminess and the subtle earthiness of the camera. I think they play really well together. Hope you enjoy it. Throwing strawberries. So a couple other fun, non-technical things about this wine. And then I have a couple questions. We, I do see your questions and I am gonna get to them. 
So Costier Denim is actually, so I think it's spelled N-I-E-M-E-S. I don't have the bottle in front of me, but I think you all probably do. It's actually where denim was originates. So denim, um, so if you were to say I'm Costier Denim, it's from from Neem. And so Denim, denim is from from Neem's France is where it originated. And it is a great, great, great little town. And Scott and I actually have had the opportunity to not only visit Neem, but to visit this winery and spend time with the winemaker. Scott used to work. So Scott's background, you worked in the restaurant industry for 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. And most recently, prior to cheese making, sold wine. He managed 100 wine by the glass, 100 wine by the glass wine list. At, and then also worked with James Beard Award winners and sold wine. So we've had a lot of great opportunities to play in the wine world per se. And we had the opportunity to go to Neem and visit this winemaker. And it, it, it's Neem is such an interesting place, a lot, a lot of history, but the winemaker is just so incredibly down to earth. Franklin is his name and this, he has a castle and this is where he makes his rosé. It's amazing. So I am going to answer these questions and then we're. The first one was kind of talking about the rind being a little different than Brie. Um, so somebody said they don't enjoy the rind typically on Brie, but they like this one. And so their question was, what is the difference or is it my imagination? Well, it's not your imagination. It's just the luxury of us pulling it right out of the aging rooms um, today. It's the uh, luxury of you having a cheesemaker at your disposal. Um, yeah, th th this is the way Brie or Camembert Rind should taste. This is the um, way a cheesemaker would intend. Unfortunately, as it goes through distribution channels, a lot of times the rind, the rind protects the cheese. You know, it's not a big deal on the, the gouda or the cheddar. But the rind on a camembert really affects the it kind of affects the texture and the flavor of of the rind. Um, Don't you think you can get a little ammonia too? Because a lot of times, you know, you think about. So Scott mentioned that a brie is a big format, right? And then you cut it, and then you wrap it in plastic. Well, cheese doesn't really like plastic. It traps in odors. It traps in. It's just not really the way that anybody intended cheese to be packaged. So you put it in plastic, that cheese is gonna continue to emit ammonia as it ages, which is natural. If you walk into our aging rooms, there's a little bit of a smell of ammonia. It's why we're constantly doing a circulation of air through our aging rooms. But in, I think that, that can lock in in that plastic and then that can, you can taste that in the rind. So I hope that answers the question about that. We also get the luxury of serving our cheese exactly where we want to serve it in terms of the aging process. Doesn't always happen with when you sell it to a grocer or a cheese shop. Somebody really, really enjoyed the introduction to Quark and said, I've never had this before and it's great. The mouthfeel is very robust and not overpowering, so it allows for mixes like you did with the honey. Can you share a little bit about the honey you use? Yes, this is a wildflower honey. Um, I would love to tell you that this is honey from our beehives, but it's not yet. And so if you're not familiar, with Urbanstead via our social media, we installed two beehives in April. And I very much hope that if we were doing this tasting next year, this would be our honey from our bees. And it's just too early for us to have honey in year one. We have 20,000 bees out back 
and our beehives are named Doris Day and Bootsy Collins because both Doris and Bootsy Collins hail from Evanston. And so we name that our beehives that we're having, a, and we work with Queen City Pollinator Project. So if you're interested in giving them a follow, they're a nonprofit run by a group of ladies of which a couple of them are my friends and they manage our hives. They installed them in April and Doris. Yeah. Doris is Doris is thriving. Thriving. Like I'm trying to think of enough words. Doris is producing honey. Bootsy, not so much. Bootsy's doing well. Doris is amazing. And so we are getting a little bit of honey this year, but not enough that I can use. And but, that's rare for a first year. Yeah. And so this is actually a really good year that our, our beekeepers have said this is a good year for bees. But Doris is doing as good as any of, a, of their first year hives. And so unfortunately, it's not our honey, but it is a wildflower honey. One of the things I always seek in honey is non-synthetics. And so I'm always looking for wild hunt flyer, wild flower honey. We also partner with Bee Haven Honey down in OTR, and we sell their honey as well. We go through a lot of honey here at the shop. And then the last question on this, on this oh, list, yeah. um, in general, what should I, what temperature should you serve your cheese? Um, our recommendation would be keep your cheese in the refrigerator to about an hour before you want to serve it. Uh, pull it out and let it come up as close to room temperature uh, beforehand as possible. Um, you'll, maybe, you'll, maybe not with a quark, though, do you think that that could be more like a half hour quark? Quark's maybe the one. It's not going to hurt it. No. Uh, it, it's just by... Allowing in the same way with having a, a wine too cold. If you have a, a white wine that's 38 degrees, you're going to lose all the flavor. If you allow that to come up to 50 to 55 degrees, the or wine. Or as will, Franklin says. He, in his tasting notes, <laughs> the rose was supposed to be 57 degrees. Not 58, not 56, 57, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope you guys got that right. <laughs> um, but you know, by warming up the cheese, it allows the. The, the flavor profile to come in, you get a lot more nuance out of the cheese by allowing it to come to room temperature. And it's kind of also why you opened that El Molino de Grace earlier is to let it breathe. So similar to a wine tasting tight, a wine tasting tight, um, because it is too cold or it hasn't had a chance to breathe, can say the same for cheese. So a cheese would be tight if it was too cold and you won't taste all everything you're supposed to taste. And it also texturally will change. You might not get text the texture that we will taste as a cheese comes up to, to room temperature. I'm trying to think if there's anything else there. And somebody did mention that Quark is the name of a great character on Star Trek DS9. I will show my cards and let you know that I've never seen Star Trek. So I, I know, I know. <laughs> oh, that's great. This is a great opportunity. Now you can watch Deep Space Nine. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting Quark. a lot of questions about Quark being an atomic particle. Yes. Well, there's mul there's like three atomic particles that quarks, but the Star Trek is more important. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. I will. I I'm not a big movie buff. Netflix, Star Trek: Deep Space Nine. Just make it to season three, and then you'll love it. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about Camembert or Cape Use Rosé or? Any of the last pairing? Now's also a great time if you want to, you know, if anybody's looking for a bathroom break, grab some water, whatever you need to do. But we're going to take a pause in between these before we dive into the hard cheeses.
Could you explain the difference between camembert and brie again for us? Oh, sure. Um, they, are, they are two cities in France. That's really the big, big difference. Uh, they're very close, uh, central France, both known for blooming rinds. So both the same, they really use the same white mold. It's penicillium candidum in both. Um, the real the real difference is Camembert, the city of Camembert makes theirs in discs. Uh, and Brie tends to make theirs in larger format that they make it into like a pie and then cut it into wedges. You would get a, a pie wedge of Brie versus a Camembert, you would get a full disc. Um, taste profiles, if you, have, if you were in that area, they would distinctively tell you they're different. But as a, an American looking from the outside, very similar. Um, their way they make them, um, the bacteria they use, the pHs that they use are all very similar. I mean, obviously, any artisanal handmade cheese is going to taste a little bit different than somebody else's artisanal handmade cheese, and that's just environment. Environment means a lot to the actual flavor of the cheese at, at the finished product. Um, and I didn't really realize that till I we tasted cheese. We had cheesemakers that at ACS American Cheese Society try to make the exact same cheese. One, same recipe, same. I mean, same cultures, process, same process, same times. Different milk, they, different cheese maker, different location. Yeah, they were one was in California, one was in Vermont, one was in Wisconsin. So the only variables was their milk and their aging. Um, very established cheesemakers know what they're doing. And the three cheeses they brought to ACS were distinctively different, even though they were supposed to be the exact same. And it's just it's the cornerstone project. Um, and it's an ongoing project. Uh, just talking about terroir. Terroir, whether it be in wine or in cheese, is a real thing. Oh, I forgot about that. Quirk is the name of the dog in Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. What should you properly store your cheese in, if not plastic? Uh, parchment? Cheese paper? Um, plastic would be okay. Um, but typically parchment or even wax paper would be an okay thing. The two things about plastic, you need air movement in and out of the, the whatever you put your cheese in. And if you plastic will, moisture will form on the surface of the cheese between that and the plastic, which is not good for cheese. You can get a little slimy. Uh, back to your question though about camembert. So there is PDO cheese. So protected, um, protected designation of origin. And so you'll have like a camembert de Normandy or certain breeze uh, are, PDO cheeses, and those have to be made in those regions. So the French are very, not even the French, just Europeans are very protective of where you make and do things. Chablis cannot be, Chablis wine cannot be out of the Chablis region of France. It's no different than the, the distillers in Kentucky wanting to produce, you know, protect the name bourbon. Uh, Parmesan, the guys in Italy want to protect Parmesan or Comte and Swiss in the Switzerland. Um, you know, Gruyere, it's, it, not so much. Gruyere, this week, Gruyere became a general term. As Well, the U.S. announced it to be a general term. So They tried to fight to make Gruyere a PDO that only certain regions could use, and they disallowed that. But like Camembert de Normandy has to be made with the milk of cows, like a certain breed of cows from Normandy. So camembert is pretty general, brie is pretty general, but then you can get more specific. But I would say to answer your question, there's an umbrella here of bloomy rinds and camembert and brie are both underneath that. And then you have more specific. Where do you think our bees are getting their bone? That's a question. Where do you think our bees? So that's really an interesting thing. So we have, a pollinator garden out back. 
but I don't see, and it is a registered pollinator garden with the Cincinnati Zoo. We have lantana and we have zinnias and thyme and lemon balm and butterfly milkweed and some false sunflowers and solidago fireworks. And I don't see our bees on it very much. And I asked my beekeepers and we, I learned, I'm learning a lot about bees this year, that more than likely our bees use our pollinator garden to go to the bathroom and that bees don't like to source their pollen from where they go to the bathroom. So more than likely other bees are using, our, or and other pollinators in general, we have a lot of pollinators. You know, we have butterflies and other types of, whether it be wasps or other bees. Um, so we have a lot of really great parks nearby us. We have Owl's Nest Park between us and O'Brienville, and there's some amazing pollinator gardens over there. We have a lot of great neighborhood. Um, when we first started the, our, our bee project, somebody reached out and said, how can they help our bees? And one of the ways that you can help them is by creating a water garden. And all you need to do is put like a plate, say, and then rocks in it and put water on it. And what the bees do is land on the rock and then they can glean a little bit of water as they land on that rock. And so people in the neighborhood have those. And so they're help, helping to support our honeybees. Usually bees stay within about three to five miles of their hive. And so they're getting it all within this region. We have, okay, you now you asked me about honey, hold on. We have a lot of uh, people in the neighborhood say that their gardens are really good this year. Yeah, though. and you'll see that. So these are three different jars of honey. I don't know if you can see them off of our hive. And so this is the bulk. This is all of the honey I've gotten this year, which is actually still a lot. This is crazy how dark this is. And then you have these two. These two taste completely different, guys. This one tastes like straight up mint. This one, we still haven't figured out what it tastes like, but we think it's chamomile. And this one's got a little bit of spiciness to it. Look at the color difference. These are weeks apart and they are off two different frames in the hive, which is crazy. Usually like when you taste honey, it's commingled off of all the frames in the hive but this is single frame honey. So they're getting pollen from a lot of different, let me put that over here, from a lot of different places as evidenced by the color of our honey is changing. And so it's really, really fascinating. Um, and somebody asked if we can talk bubbly for a minute. Are there any pairings you recommend between your cheeses and sparklings? Absolutely. Yeah, we've done lots of, we, yeah, our cork pairs really well with a traditional um, champagne or an American sparkling. Um, I, if I'm going to do that, though, I like it with strawberries. With strawberries. I think the brioche, that wonderful, the, the flavors on the leaves of a good sparkling. What do you mean by that, brioche and leaves? Well, leaves are dead yeast cells. Okay. And they call it the leaves. So as, as we would have wine maturing in a barrel, they, they leave it, the leaves leave the dead yeast in. That in turn gives the wine itself a brioche, a kind ready. of a ready yeasty flavor that I think pairs wonderful with our cork. Um, I think we did a rosé with a camembert. You could easily have done a, a sparkling rosé, a wonderful Pinot Noir sparkling. Or maybe some Albrecht, Cremant Rosé. Albrecht, Cremant. We, we've yeah. done that pairing before. That's yeah. really, really good. And we sell uh, that. And, and, and pairings are meant to be drank and enjoyed. You know, if you 
or a sparkling drinker, you're going to like just about whatever you eat with it. I mean, that's, um, I think that's the one thing that, I mean, you can come up with different pairings. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to pair. You know, you can do it texturally, you can do flavor profiles, you can do a yin and yang. Um, but it also ultimately becomes, what do you enjoy drinking? And that's something that's one of your focuses on the next one is that this wine can be paired with two different cheeses that don't feel blocked in per se, that there's only one type of wine and to pair with this type of cheese. The guardrails are pretty wide, guys. You guys ready to, to try the H cheeses? Russ, did you have a question? No, no question. Just a lot of emojis, you know, to reinforce the uh, topic. <laughs> I like your emojis. <laughs> okay, so we're going to move on to our, we have two of our H cheeses on the board today. Um, something that it's interesting. Two of our hard aged cheeses. We have three aged cheeses. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Um, so as we were putting this facility together, it's interesting because we actually had to really almost determine what cheeses we wanted to make before we built the facility, because then you build the aging rooms, the equipment, all of the other things that are necessary to make a you know, world-class aged cheese. So these are the two cheeses that, along with our Tome Davids, that, that we chose to, to, to fire up Urban Stead cheese. Um, so on the... And I'd say we chose this, don't you think, because we really wanted to go after old-world style cheeses. We're both fans. We've always been a big fan of old-world style wines. Oh, absolutely. I think that we... You know, we uh, I try not to manipulate the milk I try to allow, we were, we were making cheese as the, if it was made in Europe 50 years ago, trying to not put a heavy handed approach to it, just kind of like the wines you're tasting today. Let the, the natural growing region, let the, the winemaker have these wonderful grapes and make a wonderful wine out of great grapes. You don't need to manipulate it or do much more. Allow the, the wines to speak for the grapes to speak for themselves in the wine. I want to do the same thing with cheese. Um, so we have two cheeses here. I'm going to start with the Gouda. Or... So you're still going clockwise around. The Gouda is going to be the one in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, Gouda, 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 or Halta, um, all synonymous. Oh, um, if we go to a cheese competition, it's a Gouda. Uh, I remember the first time we have it, we have our, our cheese consultants. Uh, he's New Zealand. And one of the early consulting periods early on, we got done talking to Neville and Andrea was like, what are, what's he talking about? I like I let the whole conversation go and I thought, okay, I'll ask Scott at the end of this call what Neville is talking about. So think about a New Zealand accent and then Gouda. And but then he was like saying it like, how and, but with a New Zealand accent, and I just kept kind of acting like I knew what he was talking about, but I really didn't know what word he was saying. So, okay, so Gouda, Gouda, Halta, this is a a 15-month aged natural rind. This might be a bit more than 15. Yeah. I don't know which one you're talking about. Yeah. This okay. Is, yeah. But it's an aged Gouda. Um, we're doing a natural rind. Um, you'll also probably see crystals on those. That is not an inferior thing. That's... Meaning that you might see, like, I have, I don't know if you can see it. I've got a little hole. In, in the eyes. In the so, eye. We call that an eye. And then inside the eye, there's these little white, what appears, I've had people call me telling me there's mold on the cheese. Or salt. Or, but, it's not. But, but I'm going to taste it with my finger, and it's like magic. It's actually the protolysis. It's the, the, as the cheese does this thing as the bacteria, because we, when we make cheese, in particular like a Gouda, 
you use lactobacillus to lower the pH in order to, to create a wheel itself. But you also add what they call secondary or uh, adjunct cultures that these cultures do their work while the cheese is aging. They don't really even kick in until 60, 80, 90 days down the road. So this is a product of this abject or the secondary cultures doing their thing. They've actually broke down the, their protolysis, they're breaking down the proteins and they create a little bit of moisture. And the lactic, uh, not lactic, uh, the, the crystals that are formed there are a product of that moisture, which actually means that the cheese is breaking down properly. And it, the, if you take your finger, they're delicious. And we actually, people that are huge Gouda fans look for a weeping or a- I had somebody call me recently and they said, do you have weepy Gouda? I said, I do have weepy Gouda. And they got very, very excited. And this is- A product of weepy Gouda, which is good. So if you ever buy Gouda from us, say in a, and you'll, you'd see it more in a, a chunk, say you got a quarter pound or a half pound and you go to cut it and then it like leaps out and leaks out onto your, um, yes, it does have all sorts of stuff going on flavor wise. That Gouda is a big flavor bomb. Um, but if that Gouda leaks out or leaps out onto your board, don't think that there's something wrong. Just put your finger through it and it is, it's such an intense flavor. It's so good. There's so much umami in that, with that flavor. So we get a lot of people I, who say, oh, I don't like Gouda. And we don't get the opportunity to taste this type of Gouda in the U.S. Unless you go to a really, really good cheese shop or you seek out a really aged Gouda. But again, it goes back to Scott's trying to make cheeses like they should be made and like they always have been made in Europe and by cheesemakers intentionally. You know, we don't, you see the rind on this Gouda. So it's a natural rind. We don't yeah. wax our Gouda. A lot of times, don't you think the wax really came from the fact that a lot of this cheese had to come across the ocean. That, that's really, yeah. It, it, it's basically a way of protecting the cheese and the shipment across the ocean. Uh, and that's why they started waxing. Um, if you go to the Netherlands, you'll see, still see a lot of waxed Gouda, I think, but you'll also see some natural rind. And the Dutch eat the natural rind Gouda. What, we can come back to Gouda, but you want to talk about we're why you paired it yeah. with the Chianti? So yes, okay, so we're gonna pair the Gouda and the cheddar with the Chianti. Um, this is Il Molino de Grace. Uh, Il Molino, or Molino itself is windmill. So this is the windmill of Grace. Uh, the Grace family purchased this property in the early 90s. Um, they did everything you could possibly do to make the winery of what I would perceive as a winery. It's, they're certified organic, um, their waste is minimal. They're, they're, they doing, they're doing everything green as possible and their wine is phenomenal. So let me just tell you a little bit about this. So it's Chianti Classico. Uh, so Chianti Classico region in Tuscany, right in the heart of Tuscany. Um, Chianti itself is a pretty good sized region. So if you're getting Chianti, I would strongly recommend getting Chianti Classico. Classico is the centralized middle district, it's the original Chianti region before they expanded into a much larger region. Um, Classico is where the great vines are, were always produced. The, the, the land that they, they bought a winery that has been producing Sangiovese for 350 years. So it's- So this is all Sangiovese? It's, it, it, it even says solo Sangiovese. This is 100% Sangiovese which I think is the one thing that I really, really like about them and what they do. Um, Sangiovese, or uh, Chianti itself. That's the grape. Sangiovese is the grape, 100% Sangiovese. Chianti is the region. A Chianti, by definition, only has to be 70% Chianti. They can actually- Sangiovese. Oh, 70% Sangiovese. 
they can actually blend in up to 10% of white grapes and, and even 20% more other regional red grapes from, from, uh, from Tuscany. Um, but I think all these grapes in general are inferior to the Sangiovese that is grown in this area. You love Sangiovese. I think, well, I think Sangiovese, it's medium body, wonderful tannins, and it has that racy acidity that I think these, both these cheeses are rich, unctuous, full of fat, just, just, do you need that acidity to cleanse the palate to, to, to balance it out? That the, you need it doesn't this, get lost. No, and this is really clean. It may be a little linear, but I think it, What do you mean by that? Linear is just is a wine term for maybe not as much going on. Sometimes linear can be a bad thing, but I think this is very just straight line Sangiovese, which I in turn pairs really well with these cheeses. And those cheeses are not linear. No, not at all. And I think that's why they pair really well. I mean, a bottle like this would pair great with, they pair a lot of Chianti with Parmesan Reggiana, which is that really rich, depth, hearty, Great Parmesan has just wonderful flavor, and this the, the acidity and just pairs really well with that. Yeah, you love this. This this is one of Scott's. If people come to the shop and they ask him for a price approachable wine, but a really high quality wine, this is always one of his go tos. Uh, assuming it doesn't need to be a light wine, of course, like a rosé or a but, or a white. But this is, I wouldn't consider this heavy. This is, it's definitely not a Cabernet or uh -uh. a Syrah. It's definitely medium body, but the acidity pairs, yeah. So you like it because it doesn't overwhelm the cheese, but it has good acidity. And it also has a lot of the same characteristics as the cheese. I think there's a lot of earthiness, a lot of, there's yeah, definitely dark and rich cherry, which is not the cheese. But I think that the earth notes, the herbal notes will play really well with the cheese, the, those notes in the cheese. So what, can, thank you. Somebody said that Gouda is amazing, yum. Thank you, Cindy. Um, so somebody asked what gives the rind its color. Um, it, it really is, we are, when I say natural rind, this is, we literally form the wheels and then continually wipe down the rind. As, as the cheese itself ages, the rind will eventually harden and create a little crust around the cheese. Um, that is, that's what the color is. Um, it's probably a product of, a, you know, as cheese mold, there's going to be a little bit of molds on the actual cheese itself. We wipe those, continually wipe those off. But that's really just dried, aged cheese on the outside of the, of the rind. The other thing that's really interesting, and I'm doing it right now, guys, is... Taste how different the cheese tastes maybe out here versus down here close to the rind. It is really, really different flavor. And you can kind of see it. This is, you can't see it on here. I kind of can see it. This is one of the things we're looking for is that gradual development of color. You can see we've got the rind here. We've got a yellowing, darkening, and then it's getting lighter. She's grating my cheese. Just like if you went to a cheese competition, <laughs> that's what they would do. That's what they would do. And, and this is perfect. Yeah, cheese always cheese ages from the outside in. So you're the most mature bite is going to be right up against the rind. And on all these cheeses, the rind is edible. This is definitely, I would recommend trying. This was probably the most adventuresome rind that you would eat, but it's so we always, you know, we talk about terroir in the wine world. And I think we can talk about terroir in a couple different ways in the cheese world. One of them is with the cows and the milk, but another one is with the aging rinds. And, oh, they tasted the rind. They like it. <laughs> Good. I'm so glad. But, um... You know, we talk about the Cornerstone Project, where cheese aged in different places tastes different. And 
The, the rind tastes like our aging room. So you're getting a sense of taste of place of our aging rooms that you would not get in another place in the country. We had a cheese maker, one of the most, probably the country's most pr prolific, if most not well, top five, yeah. top five cheese makers in the country visit here. Scott trained with him. It's Peter Dixon from Parish Hill Creamery in Vermont. And Scott trained with him, but then we also took a class from Peter in November and Peter visited us here at the shop after that class. And he was flabbergasted at the mold development that we have in our aging rooms. And a lot of that is a direct relation to the fact that, and I don't think I'm going to surprise anybody on this call. We live in a very moldy region. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, we all know it with our allergies, right? But there's a lot of cheese makers throughout the exactly. Um, so there's a lot of cheese makers throughout the country who strive to have the level of mold development that we have. And in a short two and a half years, we have crazy mold development to the point that we've actually had to tamp down, tamper down our our mold development. Instead of encourage it. And every other cheesemaker across the country is trying to do everything they do to, to propagate it, to, to encourage it. And and we've got so much that it's, yeah, it, it, it's great. because But it, it brings back the sense of place that we are, these are Ohio Valley flavor profiles that if we aged this in Wisconsin, aged it in California, our microflora is uniquely different here. We have blue cheese in our, we, and we didn't inoculate our, we didn't. We've never introduced a blue cheese mold to this facility. We didn't introduce, other than the camembert, which we use the PC, the, the white mold to make a camembert. We've never introduced any molds into our facility, but we have a plethora of different molds that are. That are we high. have blue mold. We have, we have indigenous Cincinnati blue mold here that has never been, pro that we've never and it's introduced. so weird. So our cheddar is 20 pound wheels and they're tall and we're going to talk about it real quick soon. We've got to stay on track, but um, I will open a wheel of cheddar guys. And in the middle of a 20 pound wheel, there will be this vein of blue mold hanging out inside of there. And it is just found its way in either in the make process, or maybe there was a little tiny gap in the rind that that found its way in and it's an indigenous mold that's in this facility and it's found its way in and it tastes like blue and it's good you all are doing a great job we'll be definitely contacting you awesome thank you we appreciate it i'm anxious to get any gouda questions Well, let's go on to the other cheese since we're drinking yeah. with the Il Molina de Grace. Uh, so the last cheese is our street chip. Um, one of the things that really we wanted to, to make when we started this, we wanted to do a traditional English style cloth bound cheddar. Less than 1% of cheddar is made in a very traditional method in which we make it. So this um, is the way you'd make it in cheddar. Or in Suffolk County or in Montgomery. Yeah. England. When the original cheddars, which is dates back to the 1600s in, in England, Suffolk County, they make it, they make, we, we actually even make the same shape. We call it, it's called a truckle. So it looks like a big, it's a cylinder with about a 13 inch high cylinder. Um, I could definitely show you. And then, we bake it in and around, and then it's wrapped. It looks like that. So that's a whole wheel of cheddar. Um, that's the wheel, and that's a wedge on top. It's a cylinder. Um, called a truckle. Very, tr and, and, and then you take that truckle, wrap it with cheesecloth, and then paint the cheesecloth on with traditional lard. Uh, and then you allow that to naturally age. When, when I say age, our aging rooms are humidity, temperature, and dew point control. 
Um, so like our cheddar room is about 92% humid. So very humid. Um, we're trying and to get pretty the, cool, like 50, 52, 53 degrees. Um, so two, th two big advantages to, to what we're doing with the pull up down cheddar. We're allowing air movement to get in and out of the cheese, which is very important because the vast majority, 99 plus percent of, of cheddar is aged. They make it day one, they vacuum seal it and toss it in a refrigerator somewhere. So being vacuum sealed, you're not getting that natural air movement in and out, which allows the cultures, the amino acids to break down a lot better in a more quick fashion and a more efficient. And also by keeping it at 52, 53 degrees, we're also keeping that above refrigeration temperature. So we're keeping the cultures active and more, they're, they're doing their work a little more efficient. We, I mean, it, we couldn't do it at 90 degrees, but by 52, it's still in a safe, very so safe. They're still busy, but they're still safe. Yeah. Um, so. What's the, your good at aging temperature and humidity? Uh, it's a little lower humidity, about 85, or about 85% humidity, about 54 degrees. Okay. Um, so then go back to the street shed. Um, I just, guys, also, I really, I just ate a piece of street shed with a, do you have mold allergies? Yes. If he is working in the aging rooms, which he has been a lot the past couple weeks, if he forgets his allergy pill, he knows it. Um, we pay the price. And I think that you pro and I probably deal with more allergies working here. Build up a tolerance for it though, too. Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was going to say, oh, I eat my cheddar with a cornichon. And that's one of my favorite things is that like brightness of the pickle, either the green bean or the olive or the cornichon, but I really love it. And then you're like, yeah. Just cheddar and, yeah, street cheddar and acid. Good key, and yeah. acid yes. Um, so as we make cheddar, we actually take 25 pounds of cheese curds, put those into a mold, and then squeeze it together into a, a truckle of cheddar. Um, as, you, as you bite into these, you'll hopefully you're tasting a little bit of crystal sensation. Uh, I got that in the Gouda too. Yeah, which are, they call those cheese diamonds, which are actually a really good thing. They're tyrosine crystals. It's basically the breakdown of amino acids. Um, so this is a really cheesemakers strive to to if have I that. was grading your cheese, I'd give you a big break. Well, we got 96 points the last year at American Cheese Society, 96 out of 100 on our cheddar, which is pretty darn good because you need 95 points to be eligible for first place, and he got 96 points on his cheddar, and we did not place. So that tells you how difficult the cheddar category. But it probably strongly puts us in the top 10 cheddars in the country. Yeah, I would say so. Because I think three people place. Yeah. We didn't get to go to ACS this year. We were supposed to go to Portland, Oregon. It moves every year. Two years ago, we were in Pittsburgh. Last year, we were in Richmond, Virginia. This year, we were supposed to be in Portland, Oregon. So obviously, we didn't go do that. And it's difficult because it's a huge convention of all of the best cheesemakers in the country and the best cheese professionals, but it's also the largest artisan North American cheese contest. And we were really looking forward to it. And um, there's always next year. Yeah. We all know that. Yeah, there's always <laughs> next year. So, but. We were excited to send our cheese for the second time to the contest. And yeah, we're really young in this. There's a lot of people who've been making cheese for 30 years. And so for us to have been making cheese for just over two and a half years, there's a lot we're still learning, but I think we're doing okay. Hopefully better than okay. But street chat is kind of our baby. People ask us if we have children a lot, and I say yes, hundreds of them, and they are in the form of our wheels of cheese. <laughs> and they require a lot of work.
Street Chat and Big Jam with the Chianti. Ooh, now I'm going to have to try that. Can I please have more wine? He's rationing me. Thank you. As I pour in a bottle of Chianti, if you're getting a Chianti Classico, always look for the rooster on the wine bottle. It means that they are a member of the Chianti Classico Consortium. Um, it goes back many, many years, but it's basically, I think it's 13 different uh, wineries that are part of the consortium. Basically, it's a it's their pledge to to keep the high quality Chianti and they, they basically grade each other and keep each other to a very high standard. So if you're looking for Chianti, the um, Gallo Nero is always a good symbol. That's the rooster? Yeah, black rooster. Got it. And we sell all of these wines at the shop, guys. We also offer 10% case discounts. If you're ever looking for these wines or to put together any other wines, I'm sure Scott would be happy to help you. I can help you. I know more than enough to be dangerous, but not as much as Scott. But I've learned a lot from enjoying wine and being around him. Um, but you can always put together a 12 bottle box and that can be mixed wines and we provide a 10% case discount. We'll apply that for you. And um, there's one of my favorites, the cheddar and mustard. We agree. <laughs> yeah. We sell a great mustard in the shop. It's not this mustard. I'm trying to bring it in. I just need to work through how I get it from my distributor. But there's a local mustard made, local-ish. It's made in Cleveland by Old Brooklyn Mustard Company. And it is hands down my favorite mustard. They won a Good Food Award last year for their Pepped Up or original IPA. I think it was the Pepped, Pepped up. up. And it's a whole grain mustard. and and you enjoy this mustard with the cheddar, the um, old Brooklyn that we sell in the shop is out of this world with it. And we sell that in small, I'm trying to figure, again, I'm trying to figure out how to get that on board. Sometimes you run into price point issues on some of these really, really high end products. Again, the, the rind on the street chat is edible. It, it really gives you a sense of place for the aging room um, because when the wheel is fully mature, we'll take it out of the aging room. Um, we just did this yesterday. And you peel off the, the cheesecloth. It uh, actually pulls right off. And then you'll be left with a whole wheel with just this rind. Um, so really, you're, you're pulling 80, 90% of, of the mold off when you pull the cloth off. And then we take a, a towel and wipe off the rest. So you're just getting just a little bit of sense of, of that aging room, that sense of place. Yeah, the cheddar and the mustard and the stout sausage is amazing. They, North Country Charcuterie, our friends, we are friends of ours in Columbus. And man, do they make incredible charcuterie. Another thing, if you ever get this charcuterie, guys, and there's mold on the outside, and we do sell it, and you're the first group to hear this information, um, so you're getting the insider scoop, is, I'm not sure, so don't hold me to this, but in the coming week to weeks, we're gonna have additional charcuterie options. Um, I'll answer those questions. I see those. Um, we're gonna offer additional charcuterie options. We'll continue to work with our friends at North Country Charcuterie, but we're also gonna work with Smoking Goose out of Indianapolis, and they have some amazing charcuterie. So we'll have some standard charcuterie options on our boards, but then we'll have an upgraded option. But then let's say you wanna put together a cheese board at home, and we'll have some sliced charcuterie that you can buy, but also we're bringing in a pig and fig terrine that is out of this world, that's in a retail package 
It's a little um, container and we'll have that. Somebody asked, can I order the Bearcat special if we want to treat another couple? The answer is absolutely. We will likely not continue to offer this as an option on our website, but if you give me a call, we can absolutely put that together for you. And the only reason for that is, is that I can't continue. We wanted to make sure that this was available to you as a special group. And so Lauren and I worked together to figure out how to make this accessible to you, but we didn't want a lot of other people to sneak into this because you guys are a special group. And someone asked, they said, you mentioned that your business is operating diff differently right now. What can we order get currently from you? So yes, our tasting room is not yet reopened. You know, we're a small business. So we go back to March 15th, Scott and I made a really, really tough decision to lay off all um, our entire team. So usually we offer, operate with about 12 to 14 people and the world was so unsure on those days that we knew we needed to go into a very conservative mode, you know, between our tasting room being closed at that point and so and our biggest customers were restaurants restaurants so pre-covid we distribute probably 400 plus pounds of cheese a week to restaurants throughout those markets that we talked about cincinnati dayton lexington louisville indianapolis new york cleveland the first week of covid we distributed 15 pounds of cheese um it's really, really, I mean, it was, I, I think back to those days and like, I didn't know what would happen. And so we knew we needed to go in a preservation mode and that we needed to save labor. You know, we picked up, so usually we pick up 24,000 pounds of milk a month. We picked up 3,000 pounds of milk in April and Scott and I made that entire batch of cheese ourselves. I don't make cheese anymore. Well, now I do, but I wasn't making cheese. Um, it's really scary. So yes, we are still closed. Um, but, and, we, but we do have a... So we have, or what the new business looks like right now is that we are full online ordering with curbside carry out. That being said, if you wanted a catering board, let's say you're having a small group of people over and you wanted a catering board, just give me a call because I don't offer those online because they take more time to prepare. Um, but our full menu, whether it be retail cheese, cheese boards, meat, eggs, milk, honey, wine, beer, bread, um, a lot of amazing local producers products and other things are available via the order now button on our website. So the same way you ordered this cheese board, you can order other products. And uh, we do curbside carry out. So the same way you picked up the orders today, we just, you give us a call when you arrive, you designate your ordering time and we bring it out to your car. That being said, we're working very hard on trying to identify our plans for reopening. Um, I think it's probably gonna look so, like some ticketed tastings in the tasting room first to help us get our feet back under us, but also you know, just to do it in a really controlled, safe fashion because the safety of our team and of our customers is of our utmost importance. Um, and then somebody asked, does the cork come without honey? Yes, we sell it without honey. And if you ever order a cheese board and you want it without honey, there's a section for special comments. So you can just say, please leave the honey off. But when we sell it in 12 and 32 ounce containers, it has no honey. Any other questions, guys? You, you wanna leave this last? Yeah, I wanna leave the last four questions. Hope you enjoyed the cheese and the pairings.
Hey, great job, you guys. Can't say enough. I mean, it's just, just exceptional. And, and again, I'm not there, but you, you guys just did great. So much knowledge. And, and hats off to you and keep up the good work. Thank you, Darla. Oh, and so, Darla, you bring up a great point that I wanted to talk about. One of the biggest projects that I have been working on, you know, the um, artisan, the way that we all get product to the customer has really, really changed significantly over the last six months. So one of my biggest projects is direct to consumer shipping. And we, yay. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I am working on a box that I will be able to cost effectively and efficiently and safely send it to you, Darla. And so stay tuned guys, because you're hopefully in the next couple of months, you have an opportunity to be able to buy a box of cheese, whether it be for yourself or to send it to somebody else and add in some other artisanal products that we sell from that. I'm definitely the guinea pig and, and let me know and I'll pay whatever I need to, to, to make sure it happens. I love it. You guys got I'm, some good products. You really I'm writing your name down, Darla. <laughs> You're going to be my guinea. That's right. That's right. <laughs>
is from TS Farms. We give TS Farms all of our way from cheese making and she feeds it to her pigs and then we bring her meat back in the shop and sell it. And that's part of the farmstead cycle that typically occurs. We also work with Le Soup. We donate all of our excess cheese. Anytime we have something that we need to get rid of, we give it to Le Soup and they use it um, either in their school lunches program or they sell meals to help support it, but it goes back into the community. We, you know, obviously the bees are a big component of what we do. And then working with you guys, with the UC Alumni Wine Association or the UC Alumni Wine Club, and to be able to give back to the UC Student Emergency Fund is really critically important for us. So any other questions? And guys, we're here. Please don't hesitate to reach out. If there's something we can help you with as the holidays approach or, um, yes, and you people are suggesting that this is the same experience that we should use for our in-house tastings, and that's what the goal is, is that we'll do a designated number of people, say, we'll sell 15 or 20 tickets. You know, we'll do it in a way that we can properly space people, and that is exactly what we're thinking about transitioning to in this time. But we're here if you guys have cheese questions or need help or wine or whatever it is, we are here as a resource to you. And I will finish with saying thank you again to Lauren for helping me pull this together and to Russell for supporting us and to all of you for supporting Urban Stead Cheese, but also giving back to UC in yet another way. Thank you, Scott and Andrea, so much. This was great. Awesome. We're very excited that we are able to partner with you again. So thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Of course. Um, and then for everyone who was able to join us this evening, like I mentioned at the start of the event, this um, event was recorded and will be made available to you all um, post event in an email that'll go out within the next week or so. Um, and the email will also include information about some of our upcoming fall virtual tastings. The next of which will be Wednesday, September 16th. Um, and we have partnered with Emma Wine with Friends, which is down in Columbia, Tusculum. Um, and it will feature three different Washington wines. And one of them will be partnered, paired with um, two truffle bites um, from Ruby's Chocolates in Oakley. So we hope oh, that you all, yes, yes. So we hope that you all are able to join us for that one as well. So again, thank you, Scott and Andrea, and thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. Awesome, guys, thank you. Thank you. Go Bearcats. Oh, Russell, I like your pups. <laughs> <laughs> hope to see you guys in the carryout line. Yes. Thank All right, you. Thanks again. Thank you guys.